It's estimated that over a million people will suffer from an eating disorder in the UK. Those most at risk are between 10 and 19 years of age. This is the story of three young people who have suffered from anorexia nervosa, the deadliest of all mental illnesses. Hiya, I'm Lindsay. I'm here with Beats to talk to some year nine students. Okay, Lindsay, I'll just sign Lindsay in. acts as a young ambassador for Beat, the eating disorders campaigning organization. Constance kept a diary describing her thoughts and fears as she fought her private battle against a disease that almost killed her. And Rob, whose unique testimony gives us some insight into the mind of a male anorexic. They don't want anorexia to remain hidden. They want the facts to be known, because if it's spotted early enough, with the right kind of help, this frightening illness can be defeated. Okay, hey guys, um, I'm Lindsay. I'm 19 now, um, and I suffered from an eating disorder from the age of 14. I'm now just recovered, so I'd say I probably had it for about four years. Quite bad, it could a bit of a stint in hospital. A lot of girls, you know, go on diets about the age of 14. Um, a lot of my friends were doing it as well. Um, but because I have this, you know, this predisposition to getting obsessive, I think I became obsessive about the diet and it spiralled into an illness. My weight loss was quite gradual um, and it, for that reason it went quite unnoticed. It was my parents that picked it up because they could see that I was limiting my food a lot and they could see that I, I didn't see what they see when they would say, oh, you're looking slim. I'd say, oh, no, I'm not. I need to lose some more weight. There's loads of different things that anorexic behaviour can include. Um, paranoia over, over food, who's preparing your food, what you're eating. Deception, um, so you lie a lot. You lie to everyone that's looking after you. You lie to your parents, you lie to your friends. Basically, you just don't want to admit that you've got a problem because you know that means that someone's going to help you. And quite often, anorexics don't want to be helped. When I wasn't eating so much lunch, I think my friends did start to notice and they'd say to me, oh, is that all you're having today? And I would either pretend that I'd eaten more earlier or I would just say, well, yeah, I'm not that hungry. And at that stage, I thought that was how I felt. I knew that I was a little bit hungry, but I didn't think, oh, it's because I'm ill. It was only when my illness progressed and that the school got involved and my parents found out that my friends then started to really confront me about not eating. It's very important that uh responsible adults and friends are alert to the signs of an eating disorder because we know that early intervention is so critical in stopping it becoming really embedded in the individual's body and personality. Uh, but what is difficult and what responsible adults around can help with is that the individual themselves doesn't think there's anything wrong. I thought that my parents had some sort of control issue over me. Um, and even when they brought up the term anorexia and the doctor brought it up with me, I was still very close to it because I assumed that anorexia is where a girl is a bad bag of bones and she's not eating anything. The skills of detection are very important. Um, and noticing that somebody has lost weight, but often they'll disguise that with sort of baggy jumpers, being very sensitive to the cold, so wanting to sit next to the radiator, not wanting to go out, having blue fingers, a rather blue peaky nose, is a very good uh, uh, sign. Um, becoming more isolated from others, not being able to join in. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe getting A's in, in academic work. It's a common myth that only girls suffer from eating disorders. Boys get anorexia too. In fact, roughly one in ten cases are male, and many more may be going undetected. Rob was 14 when he developed anorexia. When I went up to secondary school, I became quite, quite low, really. I mean, um, it took a few years, but I, I think I probably became uh, very depressed towards the end of that. We've felt very bad with myself and set very high expectations of myself, you know, withdrawing and such, and began to be much more introverted than I'd ever been before, really. Triggers for anorexia in young men can include social pressures, being bullied or abused, and in Rob's case, coping with bereavement after the death of a close friend's parent. I think I took on quite a bit of the, the guilt 
for that because I had a stable relationship with both parents. And so around this time, I started to stop treating myself, really. I would, you know, cut myself off from all social communication, really, with, with my friends and people at school. Also, I began to withdraw almost everything I, I was eating. I mean, I was eating a very small amount and exercising more. It wasn't like a conscious decision I made to say, I'm going to starve myself, I'm going to try, try and lose weight. I never thought that at all. But it was, I really don't, I really don't deserve this. He couldn't really make himself eat something and he'd get quite upset. I think then when he got into a state, and in fact, we went up to Yorkshire to stay with my, um, in my brother and family. And I think he ate something, a bar of chocolate, and he had to go running into the loo. Um, and my, my sister-in-law then said, you know, could, you know, something happening here, really. At the same time, I, I had very serious sort of mood swings, really. I could go from being absolutely fine to, um, to being completely despondent in, in, a, in, in a matter of minutes. And, the, and he did cut himself, which I didn't realise. So he hid all that. So I think he'd come home, and this is when I was at work, and feel guilt and all these terrible things and cut himself. One Sunday when I think things had come to a head and he was in a terrible state and he said, look, and he showed me on his arm and he told me that he'd done it over a period of time. I was just devastated. I couldn't believe it, that I'd not even known that he'd done that. The fact that he'd come home and cut himself. Rob's health, both mental and physical, was deteriorating at an alarming rate. He was in and out of hospital as the medical profession tried to decide what was wrong and what to do with him. I was taken to hospital in, in a completely sort of frenzied, feral state in a way. I was just completely desperate. And I think if at that point I hadn't got help, yeah, I probably would have died. Rob is eventually admitted as an inpatient to an adolescent psychiatric unit. Finally, he could receive the care and attention he so desperately needed. It does consist mainly at, at the beginning and as it happened for quite a long time of, right, we're gonna give you three meals a day, you know, snacks, puddings, you know, and you have to eat it. You can't argue, you can't, you can't reason with us, you can't bargain, you just gotta do it. Once we've got them in a situation where they feel that they can start to eat a little bit more, can start to put on a bit of weight, then we would explore what other support would be needed and we'd be looking at some sort of therapeutic intervention. I was talking with mum about a scale of naught to 10 and and not being that you're not at all confident that you can manage it and 10 being... It was really in enlightening, actually, and also just made incredible changes in how I saw things, really. It, I mean, it was nothing, you know, nothing magical or, or mystical about it, but simply someone I had a, a really good relationship with and just talking to them on, on a regular basis helped me to work through myself, you know, trace back the how things had how thoughts and feelings had sort of evolved, really, and challenged the assumptions that were feeding them. Constance is 16 years old and attends Lord Wandsworth College, an independent school in Hampshire. She too was 14 when she was first diagnosed with anorexia. I would say running was a big trigger for me and probably the main the main cause for my eating disorder. There's quite a fine line between an enjoyment and doing it because you feel you have to, because there's a voice or anorexia makes you have to go out. And I think it comes in quite slowly, but when the percentage for your enjoyment reduces, then that's when I think there starts to be an issue. Anorexia is often misdiagnosed. When Constance was first referred to a consultant, she was diagnosed with chronic fatigue. The school enabled to help her cope with the fatigue so that she could just concentrate on her lessons was sending meals down to the house for her, which we all thought was a brilliant idea. But of course, we didn't realise Constance was just chucking all the food away. So she was starving herself completely and very successfully. It was my friends who actually picked up on it first because they were the ones who were with me during the week. So they noticed the amount I was exercising and also how little I was eating. 
they they were worried about my my destructive habits that they could see um and i think it was hard for them to know what to do with that because they didn't want to betray my trust as friends but they had to break that trust in order for me to get help it was a school nurse who spotted the telltale signs of anorexia her room was very precise, everything was very ordered. She had lists of all the exercise she was doing and how many miles she was running. She could see my room was very tidy and that's a classic sign of a perfectionism that comes with it because you want to be the best and being the best anorexic was another, another thing that you wanted to achieve. Eventually, I managed to have a conversation with her. Um, it was here in this room to ask her to open up and, you know, you can trust me, tell me what's going on. It doesn't matter what it is. And uh, that's when she said to me, well, actually, and this is a bit of a, a precede version, you can see how fat I am, Mum. I need to lose all this weight off my thighs. Um, I was doing very well at running and doing all my exercise. Um, but of course, since I've had to stop, then I can't do that anymore. I... I don't need to eat at school because I can stop doing that. That's not, that's not a problem, but I don't want to keep on eating. Now I come home at the weekends with you. Could you stop feeding me? And your heart just sinks because it's just a kadunk. You know, you know what you're dealing with suddenly. It all slots into place. Constance was admitted to an eating disorders unit for adolescents. She was there for seven months. In the really low moments, I wasn't giving myself enough food, so the decision was made to put a nasal gastric tube in me so that I was able to get enough food. And that was a really, really traumatic experience because you don't want it, and the rational side of you can see that this is not, this is not what you're meant to live like. You're not meant to be fed through a tube. Two months passed in the unit. In the outside world, her classmates were starting the new autumn term. It was the worst time for the inpatients, knowing that their friends would be going back to school and getting on with their lives. They often wrote to me and they sent me texts and they spoke to me on the phone, which was a really important part of my recovery to know that they're still thinking of me because I think you do worry about when you're in hospital for so long that people are gonna forget about you. And that was useful to still have that contact with my friends. In the darkest moments, I didn't feel that I was going to get better. But as things started to improve, I felt like maybe this was the path that I had to take in order to discover the real me. And recovery, I think, is a lot about discovery and discovering who you really are. Because ultimately, being anorexic isn't a way of life and that isn't who you are. I announced my discharge from hospital today, which was so exciting. I feel proud. And when people congratulated me, I was able to own the compliments instead of pretending that they weren't for me, which feels really important and something that I think I can value for the rest of my life for freedom. You have to believe that you will get better and eventually that, that moment when you believe that you can get better, it will come and it's really, really important to hold on to that because life without an eating disorder is so much better.